Hello, everybody. In this video lecture, we will cover uh, conservation and biodiversity topic. This is chapter 21. And I will use PowerPoint to help myself. So that's the PowerPoint that I will use. So let's go ahead and begin. So I will pick up my pointer. Now, biodiversity is variety of living organisms on Earth. And conserving biodiversity is study of understanding and, um, and traversing biodiversity. So we need to, first of all, we need to know what biodiversity is, and then we need to understand it and preserve it. So biodiversity can actually include genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. So if you look on this diagram over here, if you're looking at a population of, uh, let's say, frogs, so we need to know what is the genetic diversity of this population. Are they susceptible to different diseases? Or what are their you know, diet, what their body size? Uh, climatic conditions, right? So all their behavior, all their physical characteristic, all the metabolic processes inside their bodies are determined by their genes. And the higher genetic diversity is better for population, right? But then we need to look how many species, let's say, live in a particular area, right? Do we have a few species or we have uh, many of them? And so most species we have in a particular area, the highest biodiversity. And then if you look at ecosystem, ecosystem, I'm reminding you, inclu includes, ecosystems include populations, <coughs> communities, and all abiotic factors, such as climate, temperature, amount of precipitation, and so that's ecosystem. And of course, in, on our planet, we want a diversity of ecosystem. We don't want our planet to be just covered by forest only, or only by wetlands. So we want a forest, we want a wetlands, we want a savannas, we want a rivers, we want a oceans and lakes and prairies and you know all these different, different ecosystems that will give us a variety of plants, variety of animals, and that will increase the biodiversity, right? So that's all three uh, parts of biological diversity. So here it's, you're giving definition, genetic diversity is variations in the genes of members of a population decreases as organisms become endangered or extinct. Species diversity is variety and abundance of different species and it's important for functioning and survival of a whole community. And ecosystem diversity based on the interactions of all the species in a common lo uh, lo locale or community, <clears throat> composition varies from community to community. Now, what are the principles of conservation biology? We have four principles. And the first one tells us that biodiversity is desirable for the biosphere and humans. Extinctions due to human activities are undesirable. Complex interactions in ecosystems are desirable and support biodiversity. And biodiversity has value in and of itself, regardless of any practical benefit. So you would think, why do we need diversity of bacteria? Why do we need diversity of viruses? They're not useful, sometimes they're even harmful, right? Or why would I care about, you know, some beetles living in somewhere in Asia, Africa, I don't know, maybe even in Northern America, but I never go to that area. How would those beetles even affect my life? So even if those species does not have like very direct benefit, they still important for biodiversity, right? So biodiversity is desirable, extinctions undesirable, 
complex interactions are desirable and biodiversity has value on itself. So what are those benefits of ecosystems that we humans get? Um, we, have, we can have direct benefits and we can have supporting services. So direct benefits is oxygen, water, food, wood, medicine, recreation. We get oxygen because of photosynthesis. So during photosynthesis, oxygen is released, right? Because of photosynthesis, we have food. Many medicines come from plants, right? And supporting services include soil formation, erosion and, uh, and flood control, climate regulation, genetic resources, right? So it's all important in our life and they all benefit benefits to humans. Uh, what are those threats to biodiversity? The major threat is human activities and human activities such as habitat destruction, over exploitation of wild population, introduction of invasive species, pollution, global climate change. So on this graph over here, you can see the human footprint um, uh, and human footprint, we will talk about it in a second. This is how much resources we are using. And you see that we are going up in the resources that we need. So we need more and more. And maybe even if we don't need that more than, you know, our grandparents, but because of number of people always increasing, that's why the human footprint also increasing. And as for any species, this planet has the carrying capacity for human population. So this is world biocapacity. So this is the, the amount, how many people can be supported by human, by world resources. And you can see uh, after 1975, we already exceeded it. All right, so we exceeded our biocapacity by 50% already. Um, another human activities that affect biodiversity is habitat loss. Habitat loss through deforestation for agriculture, for wood, and also habitat fragmentation. So when we have like this little pieces of land that became islands on the land, so animals here cannot move and interact with animals in a nearby fragments of habitat, right? So that's, that's of course, is very, uh, um, very important factor in reducing the ability of these plants and animals to survive and decrease their biodiversity. Over exploitation is hunting or harvesting animals at a rate that exceeds their natural ability to replenish <clears throat> their numbers. Right, we do need, of course, eat. And we eat meat and we eat uh, plants, but we need to make sure that when we harvest some species, we do not exceed their ability to reproduce themselves because we don't want their populations to decrease and, and decrease and decrease over time and finally can get um, extinct. Um, another threat to biodiversity is introduction of non-native species by humans to a new ecosystem. Uh, when we introduce new plants and new animals, they might compete with, or they will compete with native species for food and habitat, or they can prey on them directly. And sometimes those invasive species, they they don't have uh, natural um, enemies, um, or they have some other advantages, like maybe they reproduce faster, and they can easily overcompete many native species. Now, how do we introduce these um, non-native species? Of course, it can be accidental transfer. And this is how zebra mussels were introduced in the Great Lake, uh, because it was, um, uh, it was delivered to this lake, or transported to the lake on the side of a ships. 
So people use their boats, and then those zebra mussel attached to the sh their sheep or their boat. Right? And then, you know, when sheep moves to a different area, the mussels moves with it. Also fire ant from Argentina, mongoose in the Hawaii, those are all examples of non-native species that were introduced accidentally. Also, when we introduce those species on the island, the effect is even more devastating. Uh, another threat is pollution. So flame retardants, pesticides, heavy metals like mercury, lead, insecticides, DDT, that's a poison, you know, probably already that kills um, insects. They all pose a threat to animals. Increase of nutrients due to runoff from agri agricultural field and um, wastewater result in the algae bloom, decrease oxygen, it kills fish. Um, many industrial processes and mining release heavy metals from soil. Uh, also acid deposition but by sulfur dioxide waste from power plants and nitrogen oxide from car exhaust. All this inhibits plant growth and kills fish. Um, also another threat is the climate change. So overall global temperature have been increasing. So on this graph, um, that, that's a temperature. On this graph over here, you can see uh, the global average temperature and it fluctuates, right? Going up and down depending on the year, but overall pattern is increase over temperature. Um, over here, you can see actually the same picture of the same area in 1941 and in 2004. And this way we have the glacier before. It's hard even to believe. So that's how this area looked like in that year. And now look what happened now. So all this ice melted. Also, you can see over here that the uh, emission of carbon dioxide also increasing. So um, glaciers are retreating, insect pests are increasing their home range. So now when we have here a nice and warm temperature, we can, uh, you know, new uh, pests, new insects that might be very damaging to this environment can migrate in this area because the temperature now is favorable for them. Um, however, we need to mention that human activity may not be solely responsible for temperature increase. So if we look over here um, in the global um, changes in the Earth's climate, we don't really fully understand why they happen. But you can see here we have like timeline that is really huge. Those are millions of years ago, right? And you can see that we had ice ages. So temperature goes up and then, you know, it drops and um, our planet enters ice age. And then temperature, average global temperature increases again and it drops again to another ice age. So we had like, um, four ice ages, right, before, and scientists believe that now we are in the ice age. So the temperature goes down, and you know what happened after ice age, temperature grows, right? So we live in another ice age, and temperature is increasing. So, <clears throat> so the changes in Earth's climate can be because of several factors. Uh, those are some important factors such as, of course, atmospheric composition, such as concentration of carbon dioxide and methane, changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun, and the motion of tectonic plates. So some of these factors we cannot change. Let's say we cannot change how Earth orbiting the sun. We cannot change how these tectonic plates move, right? But what we can do, we can help to decrease the amount of carbon dioxide and methane by being better um, <clears throat> consumers, right? So we can, we can do something at least about these factors. And hopefully 
preserve many, many species of um, living organisms. Uh, extinction is another threat to biodiversity, and extinction is irrevocable loss of a species. One bird species has been lost each year since 1500s. And when we're looking at species of plants and animals that are decreasing in their numbers, we can put them into two groups critically endangered species and threatened species. So critically endangered species are species that is in immediate uh, peril of extinction from its home range. So they are really, really close to be gone forever because it's irrever irrevocable, right? So it cannot be reversed. Threatened species are species that is likely to become endangered species in the near future. So 19K species, including 12% of all birds, 21% of all mammals, and 28% of the amphibians are threatened species. U.S. itself has 1,400 threatened species. Now, preserving biodiversity. Preserving biodiversity is an extraordinary challenge that must be met by greater understanding of biodiversity itself, changes in human behavior and beliefs, and various preservation strategies. Right? So how to save this biodiversity? How to leave our planet to our kids and grandkids um, the way at least as it, it is now or maybe even better. We need to study biodiversity, right? We need to understand what factors decrease and what uh, factors can increase biodiversity. And we need to change our behavior. And of course, we need to develop different strategies to help us in this uh, never ending journey. So what can we do? Well, we can save habitats uh, for plants and animals and any other living organism. So what we can do, uh, we can have the, the piece of land that would be a core reserve. reserve. And core reserve is protected. Uh, the only human activities that are allowed in a core reserve maybe uh, would be just monitoring and very low impact development. Um, and then we have bigger zones that is called buffer zone, and buffer zone allow research, education, training, tourism, and again, low impact development. And then we have transition area, and in transition area, this is where we allow development, tourism, as well as sustainable fishing, forestry, and agriculture. So when we build our cities, when we build our freeways and factories, we need to do it in the transition area and make sure we still keep buffer and core zone for animals and plants. And what is another important thing is when we create those areas, we need to connect them to each other. Those are called wildlife corridors. So we allow life plants, animals, right, whatever this life is, move from one reserve to another reserve. We allow them to communicate, we allow them to breed, to, to reproduce, and this will keep their genetic biodiversity high. And of course, we need to preserve the whole biosphere, biosphere reserve. So the whole, um, the whole planet needs to be the point of our concern. Um, so here's one of the um, successful habitat restoration when uh, we reintroduced wolves, a top predator to Yellowstone National Park in 1995, and that led to dramatic changes in the ecosystem that increased biodiversity. Because uh, wolves in the Yellowstone Park, they are keystone species. And when they were, you know, hunted to the extinction, um, we would think, well, only population of wolves suffered, but that was 
not true because the whole ecosystem of the whole park suffered from this removal of the top predator. So we need to restore this balance and it was done and it was done successfully. Uh, we also can use um, sustainable development. Sustainable de development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. In a, other words, how we can grow as, as much food as we need, how we can um, have as much fish and a, as much meat as we need. And at the same time, we will make sure that next generation will also have source of food and oxygen and water. That would be sustainable development. So here um, we can compare unsustainable agriculture with sustainable agriculture. So let's look at the soil erosion. So if we, if we allow soil to erode uh, very fast, if we um, will, um, um, if we, let's say, if we um, leave the soil exposed until the new uh, crop grow, then we will lose lots of soil. Um, in sustainable agriculture, we use what is called no-till agriculture. That means we don't plow the soil. So we don't turn it over and we leave the um, um, leftovers of the plants of the crop on the soil and we prevent it from erosion. Pest control. Uh, if, we can, if you use large amount of pesticides, that it will be unsustainable. Instead of that, we can use trees, shrubs that provide habitat for uh, birds that are, pred uh, that are predators of those uh, pests, right? So, and they will help us to control the size of pest uh, population. Fertilizer use. Unsustainable would be just use a large amount of synthetic fertilizer or Maybe we will use again no-till agriculture. Um, so we will leave leftovers of crop on the soil, allow it to um, rot and allow these nutrients to leach inside the soil. We also can use animal waste as a fertilizer. Uh, we also can use um, some <clears throat> plants that enrich uh, soil with nitrogen, for example, such as corn and wheat, instead of constantly using soybeans that replenish uh, soil nitrogen, right? Water quality, uh, if we allow runoff of all this contaminated water with pesticides, fertilizer, that would be unsustainable agriculture. If we um, use this animal waste as a fertilizer, and, um, and if we plant some, again, um, some trees and shrubs to actually cover the soil and reduce the nutrient runoff. Irrigation, either we use like a huge amount of water, use pump out this underground water, right? And we will use water faster than it can be restored back by rain or snow, or we can use moderate irrigation technology that reduce evaporation. We can use water only when it's needed. We can use this dripping system instead of sprinklers. Uh, crop diversity. Instead of having always high profit crop, that what it does is, first of all, it's used lots of uh, um, uh, nutrient from the soil, and then it also attracts lots of insects. Instead of that, we can use alternative crops. So we, we can use, um, you know, maybe uh, let's say soybeans one year and then corn another uh, year. And this way we preserve the quality of the soil, and at the same, same time, we reduce the likelihood of major outbreaks of insects and diseases. Fossil fuel use is if we use this large amount of non-renewable 
fossil fuels to run farm equipment, produce fertilizer, or apply this fertilizer and pesticides. Or we can use, again, no-till agriculture. And no-till agriculture doesn't uh, use the plowing, so we saving on using this fuel for heavy equipment. And it's also reduce the amount of fertilizer that is needed. Right, so here's our unsustainable, this is sustainable, and this is what we can do to actually increase the um, quality of the soil, uh, to grow our crop, and at the same time, make sure that we do not deplete it from the uh, nutrients needed for future um, agricultural processes. Now, our ecological footprints, the ones that we already looked, that is growing up, but what is ecological footprint? Ecological footprint is an estimate of the amount of land required to pr uh, provide the raw materials for one individual or for the whole nation. And it includes uh, food, fuel, water, housing, waste disposal. Pretty much, it just kind of uh, estimating how much land do you need to drive your car every day, to have, let's say, um, fish, uh, you know, fish or some sea products twice a week, uh, to have as many clothes as you have, to use as much electricity that you use, right? Because you need to have your refrigerator, your TV, your, you know, your cell phone. So how much land would you need to support all your needs? That would be your own ecological footprint. Now, when we're looking at this, our nation in the United States, in the United States, every person needs about 22 acres of land. And actually, this is twice what U.S. land and resources can support. So we need another United States, the whole country, to provide us with amount of land that we need to support our demands. So ecological impact um, uh, of uh, affluent nation is a problem of overconsumption and overpopulation. And so not only, you know, there is problem of overpopulation, that I think can be you know, managed by many, many different ways, but overconsumption, when we're buying stuff that we don't need, that's easy to actually fix. Right, if you see, this is a family of four having a backyard sale, and it's just so much stuff they have. Right, and if they're selling all this stuff, so they maybe need another thing <laughs> as many as they have but it's good to do a yard sales at least we don't need to buy new stuff right we can we can use you know some you know maybe some stuff that other people already use so that's also decrease our overconsumption. Um, so when you look at our globe, you can see the different nations have different uh, footprint. And of course, in the darker area, you see this uh, well-developed countries, and we really became nations of consumers. And if you look at other countries here over here, those are really, uh, you know, have very limited resources. Um, so here's the <clears throat> three graphs, three line graphs that show us a footprint per person. And you can see the per, 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 per person, uh, the footprint doesn't go up. It's really like leveled. But because the population is growing, this blue line showed the size of the population. Because population is growing and every person using the same amount of resources of course, our global footprint is going up. Now, so what to do? How to save this biodiversity? But Edward Wilson, he uses the term biophilia to describe the human desire to affiliate with other life 
in its many forms. So biophilia means love for nature, love for biology. So the Wilson first offered this term, and now many biologists um, support him. And uh, what biophilia states that, um, so, well, or the theory of bi biophilia means that in our genomes, we have evolutionary embedded love for nature, right? So, and if you look at little kids, you know, kids, well, they love their parents, but their second biggest love is what? Animals, pets. Kids love animals. And people actually love being outside. And then we have like a bad day when we feel a little bit depressed, there is nothing better than just go outside and enjoy this fresh air and nice um, nature, right? So the biophilia tell us that this is actually in our genes. We are born to be a good custodians for our planet and that give us hope. And for biologists, for biologists, of course, they embraced this concept of biophilia and they turned it in their passion for nature into their career, right? So yeah, to be a biologist, you, you kind of have to love it, right? You have to love the nature. And even if you don't have to, if it's already in your, in your genome, right? So that's who you are. So I guess the point is, we're all good people. We just need to realize it. So let's see. I think that's our last slide. Yes, this was our last slide. Thank you for watching, and I hope it was 